Down the line in York is Victor Lewis Smith, the author of the about-to-be-published Loose Ends book of this distinguished and rib-tickling program. Get the free tickets I sent you for our spectacular, lavish, funny and altogether excellent London Palladium show, Ziegfeld. That's right, Dad. Unfortunately, it was ruined for me. I think there was something wrong with my seat. You see, the problem with the seat was, well, frankly, it was facing the stage. <laughs> Oh, uh, great show, really, Neddy Baby. Brackets, sincere chuckle. Keep him with a superannuated old git, because he could finish me in entertainment. He knows all the showbiz greats. Russ Conway, Norman Vaughan, Ronnie Carroll, Paul Carr, and Teddy Johnson. Sing, little birdie. Sing, sing, sing. Uh, I've forgotten who I am. Uh, 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 it's Monday morning, and as I walk into the reception of Broadcasting House, I notice a large group of producers about to go off on their rambling weekend. I don't know. I don't know. Not your conventional rambling with hiking boots and have a snacks. More your mental rambling BBC star with oxygenarian program makers on medication who don't know who they are and where they are, what they do without Radio 4 and Margaret Howard. Yes, it's been a year now since any of his pieces have been included on Pick of the Week. So, Margaret, get your act together or it's punishment every week for you. Meanwhile, I'm in rehearsal because I've been booked to play Von Aschenbach in a new BBC drama production of Thomas Mann's Death in Venice. Okay, and on your marks, Tadzio, and cue music, action. My whippet, dressed in a pert sailor boy suit and a straw hat, gives a provocative twirl in a pederastic know-what-I-mean-guy sort of a way. My thick black mascara runs down my face as the hotel manager, played by Marmaduke Hussey, assures me that all is well. Uh, Why are they disinfecting everywhere? Why? Not, uh, um, nothing to worry. Huh? There's no illness at the BBC. No illness here, sir. Huh? It is spring. Take your boy with it and be in love with him. It's bloody illegal, John. Eh? It's illegal. Gratuitous German literature jerk number one. So, uh, you, you like Thomas Mann? Oh, yeah, Felix Krull, great, that is, yeah. No, 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 Thomas Mann, Dylan Thomas Mann. Oh, yeah, didn't he write Tin Drum, man? No, no, no he's got the grass. Got the grass? What, Dylan Thomas got the grass? Why, drink? No, was it? no. Was it the drink? No, man. Why do you go to the grass? Oh, listen to Oh, he thinks he's so bleeding clever yeah. just because he's got a CSE in German. German that's right, doll. You know his bleeding German jokes. jokes. Yeah. I won't have him in the house. house. I don't forget that easily. You know, well, what don't you forget? I've uh, forgotten. Oh. I know a German joke. What's that then, the German? Well, d do you know Greta Garbo, oh, why she used to sprinkle grass seed in her hair every night, right. doll? Why's that? Why is that? Why she, she wanted to be a lawn. No, why do you want to marry a lawn? No, I, well, I, spo I suppose oh, sure. she wanted to marry Gunter Grass. Oh, who's he? Well, he Gun wrote Dylan Thomas. He said oh. so on the radio. I ate his guts. Yeah. He's so clever, clever. He's clever. He's clever. Oh, does. Son. He's got a CSE in German. German. Oh. Well, don't worry, Mum, because it's time for the Victor Lewis Smith Guide to the British Class System. Part one, the working classes. And the mystery object this week is... Picking your nose and eating it. Picking your nose and eating it. Yes, that's what the working classes do. They pick their noses and they... Frankly, I've been reading a lot of Marshall McLuhan recently. Marshall McLuhan? Marshall McLuhan, there's a gunfight down at Red Gold. Listen, I've told you before, I'm not a lawman. I'm a professor of sociology. Uh, okay, I'll try Mr. Dillon. Mm. Mr. Dillon? Mr. Dillon? What do you want, Bio? As I was young and easy, imbibable, black, do not... Go as I was saying, I've been reading a lot of sociology and musing over the class system. Working, middle or upper, you're all equally nasty. Most of you listening are middle class, sitting in your BMWs, listening on your car radios in the car park at Sainsbury's, and know nothing of the lower orders at all. Oh, hey, darling, listen, he's going to be rude about the working classes. Really? Who are they, then? Oh, you know, those sweaty, disgusting endomorphics who stock up the shelves. Good oh. God, are they human? Turn them off. Yeah, yeah, Turn them yeah, off. Good idea. It is fashionable amongst modern American be Look, hold on a second. Put me oh, you can't hear me for the engine. Put me on a decent radio. That's better. It is fashionable amongst modern angry comedians to heap unadulterated praise upon the working classes because they seem to think that the downtrodden element should be subjected to no further trampling. However, there are one or two tiny working class character traits that I find a little irritating. Let me explain in proletarian terms. My I Spy book of the lower orders gives these telltale signs for the identifying the working class. The gentlemen wear their socks, string vests, and their nasty soiled underpants in bed. They eat pot noodles, instant mash, and regard Vesta curries as an exotic departure into oat cuisine. They have children called Clint, Wayne, Lee, Daryl, Lorraine, and Tracy, who they attempt to control by shouting the following. Hey, Tracy, come here, you bastard! Come here! Hey. Moreover, they eat off Tupperware plates, have pictures of green ladies and storming elephants in their front rooms, which they decorate with flock wallpaper. They believe consumer durables will make them happy, and they want, 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 and they talk about what they'd do if they won a million pounds on the pools. But if they ever did, their dreadful home would be bigger, but they would have the resources to make it look even more tasteless. They have teeth that look like disheveled graveyards, they pick their nose and eat it, and their general level of personal hygiene leaves much to be desired. Their council houses are cesspits of filth and ordure, which are never spick and span. Hello, doll. Hello, doll. Oh, hello. Sorry to bother you. The thing yeah. is, that they've, run out, they've run out of spick at the co-op. Oh, I've only got span. Oh, span. Spans no good without spick, no. is it? Oh, you want the house spick and span? I'll oh, just yeah. have a look in the cupboard. Oh, look, 
Oh, no, would you believe it? I've, I've got no spick in the house. Oh, dear, no, no spick. No spick. No spick. No spick. None at Not all. Not a bit of... It is also an irony to refer to this class as the working class, since in reality they are the most indolent. Their idea of a good time is laying prostrate on Raylan Suite, shoveling Chris, peanuts and brown ale into the kick holes while they punctuate endless trivial TV game shows with the crack of their flatulence echoing across the room like machine gun fire, and which serves as an endless source of amusement because isn't it naughty? Thank you, Vicky. Even more disgusting than the working class is the fact that there are certain members of the middle class who attempt to emulate them. More about the middle classes next week. But in the meantime, listen to Jeremy saying farewell to his Surrey stockbroking parents on his first day at university. Bye bye, mummy. Bye bye, Jeremy, darling. Bye bye, Daddy. Bye bye, Jeremy. See you soon, mummy. Yes. See you next time. Bye bye, Jeremy. Bye bye, Jeremy. But on arrival at university, Jeremy undergoes an attack of reverse to Joan Bakewell syndrome and does ten years of elocution lessons in the laboratory, sounding about as generally working class as Ben Elton. Oh, hi, huh? my name's Jeremy. Right, where would you live? Dagnan. What's your parents do? Dead. What's yours do? Uh, dead. Where do you live? Ilford. Well, nearby, Hampstead. Uh, oh, oh, that's disgusting. I mean, imagine saying I'm your parents is dead. He's sick in the mind, yeah, isn't he? He's disgusting. sick. He's disgusting. <laughs> And it's not only the middle classes who change their accents. The following is a distillation of Saturday nights in working men's clubs everywhere. Hey, thank you very much indeed, ladies gentlemen. I just love your Bradford. Thank you, you wonderful people. Okay. The wonderful people to whom this fully shirted, suntanned, gold medallion wearing singer refers are revolting toothless old crones waiting for the bingo and listening to tear jerking, schmaltzy, sentimental songs which anaesthetize them to their drab, wretched existence that they suck on their bottle of crisps. What they think they're hearing is an itinerant star from Caesar's Palace, but listen closely as his accent deteriorates from West Coast to West Hartlepool. Okay, ladies gentlemen, you're warm and wonderful. Is my old pal Tony Bennett's favorite number. It's a little tune I sang recently in Las Vegas, and it's called I Left My Art in San Francisco. This one's just for you and you. Next week, Nelly, I'll be analyzing your class, the lower middle, and I leave you with this rather philosophical thought from Lao Tzu's Dao De Ching. The philosopher asks Why did Hedgehog not wash his hair? Answer Because he left his head and shoulders on motorway. Corrupt soft stop party. Don't give me that, John. You are the fool. You are the fool from me. You'll pay for it. <laughs> Victor Lewis Smith, up the line in York.